Good morning. Good morning, sweetheart. Side note here, um, if you meet somebody, if you're a single guy and you meet somebody and you want to get to know her better, looking at her through binoculars could get you in trouble. So just saying. <laughs> just saying. I <laughs> think they call that stalking. I don't know. So we grew up, I grew up pretty trashy, and, and I've, I'm, I'm still a little trashy, but I've grown out of some of that. But we didn't use binoculars a lot, but we'd go over to Uncle Alan's house, and Uncle Alan lived in town. And every time Uncle Alan got a new rifle, came with a new scope, and he'd be like, oh, oh, you got to see this scope. And so we would all go stand on the front porch and take turns looking out that scope. Because uh, when you're trashy, you don't think about that until the neighbor calls and says, why are y'all standing on the porch <laughs> with a high-powered rifle pointed at my house? Anyway, <laughs> be mindful of where you look. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. I uh, have spent the last couple of weeks talking about the blesseds. Jesus got up in front of the disciples and a crowd of people. The crowd had shown up to see him do miracles. They wanted to see the hand of God, which I've heard lots of messages on that. That is not inherently wrong, okay? It's not wrong to want to see what God can do for you. What becomes problematic is over time, if that's all we ever want, is, you know, what can you do for me, not ever considering what we may be asked by God to do, or moreover, what we need to be doing in our lives to create a better system or a better situation, okay? And so they had gathered because they just wanted to see miracles. And Jesus, uh, he, he steps up to the plate and he begins to speak, and he starts saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And then he said, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall see comfort. And those were the last two messages. If you didn't get to see them, a uh, high Facebook crowd, uh, they're on Facebook from the weeks uh, past. You can go back and listen to them. And the reality is, is Jesus is going, you can have this goodness. You can have this, this wonder. You can have this life that's miraculous. You can have good things in your life all the time. It doesn't have to just be when you show up to watch me work. If you'll do these things, you're going to see more blessedness in your life. And really, I've been kind of juxtaposing here blessedness versus normal, right? I don't think it's got to be you're either blessed or it's bad. I think some of us just get in the routine or the rut of just normal. This is just normal. And Jesus is going, you can have a new normal if you'll do some things that ca cause and create blessing. And so... If you've been coming to church here at all over the last 10 years, one of my favorite characters to talk about is Joseph in the Old Testament. And generally, I talk about everything Joseph went through. I want to fast forward today. So 14 years later, Joseph had been sold into slavery. He had been, so he was a slave, and then he gets thrown into prison. He has this messy life. And then he understands that there's going to be seven years of good, and then seven years of famine. And him knowing that, him knowing the dream, if you don't know that story, it's in Genesis, you should go read it. It's a great story. So 14 years later, and that's after the 20. So he was 17 when he's thrown in, uh, or when he's sold to slavery. 20 years, he's either in prison or a slave. And at age 37, he gets the accolades. All of a sudden, he becomes what God told him he would become, 20 years later, and it still takes 14 years to get through the end of this thing. 14 years after God did everything he said he was going to do, so now that's 34 years, Joseph is now a hero. He's now a huge name in Egypt and in Israel, and we still talk about him today. 14 years after the promise begins, Everything that was ever said about him happened. Everything God said happened. All this, all this blessedness happened. That's when he's blessed. You can bet he's not blessed at the beginning of the seven years of promise because he's still dealing with his brothers and his family and trying to get all of Israel in there. And you can sure bet he's not feeling blessed when he's in the seven years of famine. But at the end of that, when the famine's released, all of a sudden, you get to watch him be blessed. 
Now, another guy I like to talk about is Nehemiah. So Nehemiah grew up a slave. When Nehemiah is in his early 20s, he had never been to Jerusalem, but he heard that Jerusalem was in shambles. And he goes to his master and says, would you give me permission to go to Jerusalem and help rebuild the city and to rebuild the temple? And then I'll come back and be your slave some more. Bless it. When we think about Nehemiah's story, and in fact, what we find out is that his king, his godless king, his king that has him a slave, says, not only will I send you, but I'm going to send workers to go help you, and I'm going to fund the thing blessed blessed daniel we read about daniel in the lion's den and daniel and you know all this stuff that's happening when he gets captured into slavery and we watch daniel work for three separate kings and all the time he's working for those kings people hate him and people trying to kill him but all the time he's blessed and so whether it's daniel or whether it's joseph or where it's nehemiah we can go look at their blessed times but what we got to do today is we got to back up and go look at the hard times because it's in the hard times that we achieve what it's going to take to be blessed in the blessed times number three beatitude number three blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth I think the first one, the poor in spirit, that's good. That means you have to have an introspective look at life and always know that everything you ever get comes from Christ. Every breath, every morsel, every, everything you eat, every blessing that ever happens comes from Him. That's being poor in spirit. And you get blessed because the kingdom of heaven is yours. When we mourn, we get blessed because we have the ability to be comforted. We have the ability for God to be close to us. But this one... This one may be the most exciting to me. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. For all these men, the three that I've just mentioned, and there's far more than this, but for these three, God took the resources of the ungodly. He took the riches of the people. He took the authority of the disobedient rulers and he used all those resources to bless the obedient. I think often we look at our lives through the bubble of where we stand and the struggles we have and the pain we have, and we forget that in the midst of that, if you'll be meek, and we'll get to meek here in a minute, if you'll be meek, God will take the resources of the ungodly, the authority of the foolish. He'll take things that aren't yours and let you have them <clears throat> now let's break this down the first thing i want to get into is he uses the word inherit so he says blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth and so when he uses when jesus uses this word inherit it means exactly what you think it means okay it means that you will obtain you will take possession of and then more specifically by way of inheritance now if you haven't ever inherited anything uh, this may be a crazy thought to you. And, and I, so my, all my people live to be old. So I haven't inherited anything yet. Okay? But I got my eyes on some stuff, you know. <laughs> In fact, just like if we're being honest, uh, my grandfather got remarried a couple of years ago, or I guess last year. I guess this year. I don't know. It's so like I'm, I'm out. He married somebody my wife's age. And so it's frustrating, and we were talking to him because we're like, dude, you got four kids, 11 grandkids, 25 great-grandkids, and, like, we don't think this is going to go well. We have signed some paperwork because we're looking at inheritance, right? And so as a, as a grandson, I don't want his antique tractors sold just so she can have some money. I don't want, you know, uh, you know, selfish or not. This isn't about, don't worry about me being selfish today. Worry about <laughs> what the word inheritance means. I mean, I'm going, that man worked so hard. My grandma worked so hard, and they had these things. And it says in Proverbs that a righteous man uh, has an inheritance for his children's children. Inheritance means there's something, and I get to obtain it 
when the time is right. That's what inheritance means. That's all I'm trying to prove right now. It's going to do a little, you know, self-counseling while I'm up here. Now, God's saying, I've got something for you to inherit, which means to obtain or to take hold of, to take possession of, when the time is right. Now, again, this, this goes back to this waiting. We read over and over in the scripture, he says, those who wait upon the Lord will mount up with wings of e- like eagles. Those who wait upon the Lord, it's, it's about going, wait, wait for it, wait for it, it's coming. And I wonder how many times we miss our inheritance because we just give up. We go do our own thing. So inheritance means you're going to take possession. You're going to obtain what? Well, the word here is earth. And this is the, the earth in Greek, it's the G-E word, so G or G, I'm not, I'm not sure how you say it, I don't speak enough Greek to say it. Uh, and it's, it, it means, let me, I wrote it down, land, soil, or region, okay? It, it's not necessarily you're going to inherit the, the globe, right? I think to us, we're going, okay, that just sounds poetic. No, he's saying, blessed are the meek. Because God is going to let you have soil, land, and regions that you didn't earn. That's the, that's the biggest key in inheritance. Something you inherit, you did not earn. You get things that you didn't earn. Nehemiah got things that he didn't earn. Daniel got things he didn't earn. Joseph got things he did not earn. Or earn in the natural way. He inherited things because he was meek. And I'm talking about dirt, land, soil. When you get done with church today, drive over here to the old steakhouse or bar H, whatever that, K-Bob's. The old K-Bob's. Just go, and this is crazy because I've been planning on preaching on this. I didn't know what would be happening this week. But I just want you to literally leave this building and go back there and look at the pile of dirt that is piled up out there. Because New Life is a meek church. And I'm going to get to meek here in a minute. But because we're meek, we get things we didn't earn. They're digging a drainage pond out here. And they've got to move all this dirt somewhere. But because our church is a meek, obedient church, I can say things to the city manager like, well, you wouldn't have to haul it if you just left it right there and left it level." And I don't know how many thousands, probably tens of thousands of dollars. Who do you think it's? Roger knows. I mean, tens of thousands of dollars of soil is just ours. It's just ours. They've piled it up out there. They're going to flatten it. They're packing it down. We're moving over to put our new building on top of it. I mean, it is happening right now. We are inheriting dirt that we did not earn. And that is what the Christian life is supposed to look like. I'm going to come back to that. So we know what inherit means. We know what earth means. And this isn't just like, I mean, it's soil, dirt, and regions. It's like areas. Like we can pray and say, "Mm, we want Dalhart. We want Dalham and Hartley County. That's what we want. And he goes, okay, I'll give it to you. I'll give it to you. Now we got to get to the how. Because I think we all understand the inheritance. Like, that's good. We want, we want that. That's fun. That's neat. I want it. Well, you can have it, but the question is, how do I get it? The word me is such an awful translation in our Bibles the way we speak today. Some of your translations say gentle. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. It's the same word that's in the, in the fruit of the Spirit. You've got love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness. Okay? In King James, it says meekness. And you and I understand the word meek to mean quiet, shy, subdued, backed off. In fact, few of you would ever even describe me as meek if you knew me. Like, that's not even, you wouldn't look at, at me and go, oh, that dude's meek. Uh, you would say lots of things, but meek would never be one of those words. We've got to get into the Greek here and understand that the word here is praeus, P-R-A-U-S, praeus. And the word Greek, or the word praeus, comes from the Greek from an ancient military training word for horses. Now all of a sudden we can understand and embrace the word gentle. 
We use the word gentle when it means to touch softly or to be kind or backed off, except for when we're talking about horses. Sweetie Pie was the perfect horse. My grandpa had a horse whenever I was a child. Uh, Again, there were 11 of us grandkids. And Sweetie Pie literally would walk over to us and get down on the ground so we could get on her back, bareback, four grandkids. And she would get back up and take off walking, never running, never trotting, never running off with us. However, if my dad and my grandpa got on there, she would help them get on the ground. (laughs) She would buck them off. But to the children, I've never had a horse ever that would get down on the ground so that I could get on it. That's all I really, I want Sweetie Pie back. That's best ever. Gets down, gets on, never takes off running because she is gentle. We describe horses today as gentle when they're trained, when they're focused, when they do what they're supposed to do, when they're supposed to do it. We're not talking about a horse that you got to drag, and we're not talking about a horse that you got to woe. We're talking about a horse that is obedient under fire. Well, if you follow that word back to your King James, it's meek. In England, they would not use a horse for war unless it was meek. It has a double meaning in, Engl- in Old English like it does in our English. And it, it means two things. Meek means horses under control. Preus is the same way. So here we go. The Greek army would go find the wildest horses in the mountains and bring them in. After months of training, they sorted the horses into categories. Some were discarded. Others were put into ordinary duty. But the fewest of all the wild horses graduated and put into service were called preuse. When a horse passed the conditioning required for preuse, its state was described as meek, gentle, or preuse. And it meant that that horse had power under authority or strength under control the horse was always determined strong and passionate however it learned to bring its nature under discipline strength on the right grounds in the right manner at the right moment for the right amount of time you can go read all about this i just took a snippet this is on mattnorman.com he goes back and explains this whole uh, word gentle meek Preus. One of the tests that they would do for these horses, so they'd take these wild horses, they'd get them trained up. When they knew they were battle ready, they could take their, uh, I'm sure it wasn't oil and gas, this, this was old days, but they would light tar, and it, all the a horse could see was these flames, flames 10, 12 foot t- tall. The rider would come around in a circle, and he would go towards the flames, and if the horse would obey the rider and jump through the flames, horse doesn't know what's on the other side of the flames. But the horse thinks they may be jumping into their death. If the horse would jump into the flames, it was now considered prey use and ready for war. Meek. Obedient unto death. Well, now you begin to understand Joseph a little bit more. It wasn't what Joseph did when he was a leader that made him blessed. It's what Joseph did when he got sold into slavery that made him blessed. It's what Joseph did when he was in prison that made him blessed. He was obedient to God when the circumstances were all wrong. Preuse doesn't mean I'm obedient when it's going my way. Preuse doesn't mean I'm obedient whenever I'm happy or I'm obedient whenever whenever things lined up. It means I'm obedient when it's all falling apart. It means I'm obedient to God when it's a mess. And the easiest thing for us to do as Christians is to check out of our responsibility when the people that we're dealing with have checked out of their responsibility. I guess, if you're like me. That's what your neighbor struggles with. The person sitting next to you has a hard time, not you. Acting upright, being righteous when they're being wrong. And somehow, as a church, we've, we've gotten where, the, you know, where we feel entitled to that. It's like, well, I would act right right now, but you're not acting right, so I don't have to act right. Nehemiah. Nehemiah got the full support of his king because of the kind of slave he had been. And I don't know that any of us have ever been in situations that are similar to slavery. And y'all are 
Sometimes we look at our work situation. Sometimes we look at our financial situation. Sometimes we look at, at what's going on in our lives. We're like, you know what? If this is what it's going to be like, eh, eh, eh. Well, here's a cool thing. You don't have to be meek to be saved. You can be saved. You can follow the Lord and just have normal. But Jesus says, if you want more than normal, if you want blessed, be meek. Take Daniel. At what point do you think Daniel would get tired of it in his life? Just go read the book of Daniel. He's an old man, and at some point you finally would think he'd go, ah, I'm done with you idiots. Not him. He was righteous until the day that he died because he was meek. He understood that it didn't matter what everybody else thought about what he was doing. He did what the Lord was asking him to do. Obedience under power. Whenever I, when I, try to, I, I try to think about analogies that, that make this make sense. I always go to my sons and my daughters. I, I think really, as a church, we disconnect with the reality that we are sons and daughters of the living God. And when we're on the job, we represent our father. I had a phone call, this is, this is some time back, old JB was working for me, and, and we had a contractor that was helping him, and JB got up that morning, they were putting in, uh, they were putting in pipes for a fence, and they were using sackcrete to do it, and I've been using sackcrete since I was a young man, and I, I'm picky about my sackcrete, that's just how it is. I want it to be wetter than it needs to be. I've pulled out fence pipe, fence post, and it's all powdery years later, it's because they didn't get it wet enough, right? And so I realize the dirt soaks up the water. And so my deal is, and my dad's the same way, and if dad was up here, we'd just be going, oh, my gosh, just get frustrated. People don't put enough water in there. So I told JB that morning, I said, the contractor's going to get there, and he's going to tell you that's too much water. I said, but here's what I want. I want you to fill that hole up with water, then put a little sackcrete, then a little more water, a little sackcrete. I said, it's all going to turn out fine. It'll take extra days to dry, but that sucker, that's, that's what I want. Okay. Well, just like Daddy said contractor got out there and didn't like the way he was doing it and I ended up on the phone with this sucker who's yelling at me while he's yelling at JB in fact when I answered I heard him yelling at JB and you know what it's like to be a father and here's somebody yelling at your kid and this is what I this is what he tells me on the phone not JB this guy he goes your son doesn't understand that I'm in charge of this job <laughs> and all of a sudden I thought oh this is going to be fun <laughs> I said, you don't understand. I'm in charge of this job. And I got done. He yelled at me. I yelled at him. And at the end of it, I'm like, you got two options here. You can either work for my son or you can come get your check. My point in telling you this is this is I'm, what I believe God does. This is, what, this is the way God sees us. He's not concerned about how old you are or how long you've been a Christian. What he's concerned with is you're his son. You're his daughter. He's in charge of the job. He's called you to do it. And he doesn't care if the governor comes in. He doesn't care if the president comes. He doesn't care who they are. You're his son. You're his daughter. He's given you all authority to be in charge of the region that you've asked for. This guy, older guy, just looking at JB going, well, you're not old enough to be in charge of me. That's not how it works in the kingdom of heaven. The meek shall inherit the earth. JB could have been not meek that day and said, well, my dad's crazy about concrete. Do it however you want. I mean, they could have just done it. And that's not what he wanted to do. He wanted to do what daddy wanted to do. And daddy gets lined up behind that all day long. And I'm telling you, your heavenly father is just like that. God wants to take the resources all around you and bless you. And I'm serious. He wants his people to be the salt and the light and to take over everything. I can't tell you, I just told my wife yesterday, how proud I am to be a Texan right now. In the midst of the entire world melting down about a virus, we've overturned abortion laws. I love it. We have godly men and women in our Texas. They just said, you know what? While everybody else is busy doing this, Let's go back and add some righteousness to our state. I love it. I am absolutely elated because that is taking ground kind of stuff. Hey, while they're not paying attention, let's take back what's ours. That's who God's people are. 
taking back what's ours and letting God use resources from everywhere. Now, I want you to, want you to hear me clearly. Transactional is a big church word that preachers will sit around coffee and talk about. Okay? Transactional and salvation shouldn't be in the same sentence unless you're putting a knot in there. Here's what I mean by transactional. You can get in the wrong mindset that salvation is tra- transactional by thinking, if I'm good enough, God will save me. No, there's no transaction. God says, I'm saving you. You just need to receive it. Salvation's free. You don't have to do anything to receive it. So then when you hear messages like this going, okay, maybe I need to do more. For salvation, no. For blessings, maybe. But I want you to hear something. This, today, right after I get done with church, I'll go eat lunch. And any of my kids that are going to come and eat with me, I will sit down and eat with them and I'll pay for their meal. Kaylee, my daughter's 10 hours from here. If she drives up, I'll feed her dinner. I'll pay for it. But if she's not here, she won't get lunch with me today. Okay? No punishment. I'm not keeping her from something. You, you get that? Like, I'm not mad at her. She's just not here. This blessed stuff, this is not about God going, hey, if you'll be meek, I'll do more. No. He's already going to lunch today. And if you go sit up at the table with him, he'll pay for lunch. He's already doing on earth all this stuff and he's just asking you want to sit at the table or not this isn't transactional like you need to earn it this is when you're meek you're sitting at the table he's like he's got a load of dirt he's about to dump somewhere and if you're sitting at the table you can have the dirt period in the story god wants to bless you now i need to tell you when you're blessed that doesn't mean everything's perfect doesn't mean everything's okay joseph had plenty of problems nehemiah had plenty of problems daniel had pr- plenty of problems this is not that it's not that gospel that says if you'll do better everything's perfect it ain't perfect but you sure can be blessed in the middle of what's going on on earth Here's a couple of things I wrote as I land this plane that you need to hear. If you find yourself in life being the tail and not the head, I think sometimes you find yourself at work, uh, you find yourself on boards, you find yourself in places, and you feel like you're the tail and not the head. Well, God didn't call you to be the tail and not the head. He called us to be the head and not the tail. So if you find yourself being the tail in any circle of your life, number one, ask yourself, Am I acting in blind obedience? You may be the tail because you're not living in the fullness of your power under authority. You may not be stepping out there in faith where he's asked you to step. Number two, if you're going, all right, I feel like the tail and not the head, and I'm walking in faith here, then you've got to ask, have you waited long enough? Some of you are waiting on this blessing. Just hang on. It's coming. I think Ricky Griffin used to say God has never passed up an opportunity to show up at the very last moment. (laughs) Seems like when he's saving me from drowning, the water's about here sometimes before he gets there. And I'm going, oh, you could have come a little sooner. And he says, I know. (laughs) Don't give up. If you're walking in obedience and you just haven't seen it yet, don't give up. Hold still. He's coming because he's going to do what he says he's going to do, and that is bless those that are obedient. And often, I'll tell you the flip side is this, once you get into a routine where you're living in the blessed life and you're the head, you're going to get frustrated with tails. People who are tails are frustrating. I think when we're living in blessings, we're going, why? Why do I have to deal with a contractor that just wants to argue? Why are they acting like a tail? And it's just because in God's cosmos, the way he created things, everybody's not going to be ahead. There's going to be a tail, and so you just have to ask for grace and peace when you're dealing with tails or rear ends or however you want to look at it, okay? However it is they're acting, ask for a grace with it because part of you being ahead is knowing that you're going to have to hire tails, you're going to have to work with tails, you know, that's just how it is, so have some grace with it. Now, as I end, I want to tell you, in 2010, this month, 2010, We came up here and we interviewed, and as soon as they hired me, I I started in October of 2010, and I said, there's two things that are non-negotiable with me, and the elders agreed. One of them was, we're going to stop passing the plate, because we're not trying to drum up money around here. We're going to put a box on the wall, like the Old Testament says, and that's between God's people and God. We're not here to raise money, right? 
they said, fine, we'll try it for six months, and if the money goes down, we're going to, I guess they were going to pass the box around. I probably threw the plates away. Uh, anyway, we put the box on the wall, and they said, if the money goes up, we'll keep doing it. If it goes down, we won't. So we did that. We were obedient in that. Number two, I said, I don't ever want to ask people to tithe if this church doesn't tithe. It's been years since I've worked for a church that didn't tithe. I've worked for churches that didn't tithe, and they're not blessed. And then I've worked for churches that tithe. And so when, what I mean by that is new life. This church takes 10% of every dime that comes in, and we give it to somebody else. And so for 11 years now, we've been a tithing church. And I cannot even tell you all of the blessings that have happened over that time. This church has given away over a quarter million dollars since I've been working here. And it just, it, God just keeps blessing, keeps sending things our way. He keeps, I mean, things will just pop up like this dirt's no surprise to me because we're obedient in that way. God gives us land that's not even ours. But here's some of them. This year, there's uh, fifth quarters happening. And, and there's, the other churches in town aren't interested in this atmosphere and doing the fifth quarters. And so I think there's five home games, five fifth quarters, and so New Life has all five of them. We went to the first one, and what a fifth quarter is, is after the football game, all the kids in town come in, and you get to, get to share the gospel with them, feed them pizza, and play volleyball with them. 250 kids came to the first one, and it's all ours because we're just obedient and said, okay. We just say, okay, and we get that. Uh, we have jail ministry in this town. New Life goes into the jail and ministers weekly. The prison, not only does the chaplain go to this church and is a member of this church, but there's a uh, faith-based dorm out there that's under our name. There's a dorm that's just for believers out there, and we have the ability to walk in and out of the prison anytime we want to go minister to them. I have to, I have to knock uh, so I don't get shot, but... I just call out there, and literally, if you have an uh, interest in doing prison ministry, you can call me. We can go out there and just go hang out with those guys. Open doors just because we're obedient. Um, got the faith-based dorm, the Kairos. All the Kairos is based out of here and does that ministry. We've had people from this church on city council. We've had people from this church on school board. We have people from this church that are all over the FPC campus. At every school, we have, we have heads at one of the four schools. We, we have heads all throughout our school system. We do, we have gone to the funeral directors, and we tell them we'll do any funeral for the people that don't have families to do funerals or churches to do funerals. It's just the mindset of we'll take it all. We'll take it all. We don't have a limit on what you'll give us, Lord. We'll take it all. We're on every campus. We're all through this town. And New Life gets to go up to the junior high every Tuesday and speak to 200 kids because we're part of this Elevate program that the school just lets us come in. We pray in the schools. They, so uh, there's really no problem with praying in schools in Dalhart, and we do it every week. Um, and th this is just a small list. We have asked for Dallam and Hartley counties. God is giving us Dallam and Hartley counties, the soul, the region. We have a stance here. We have a speak here. And I don't want it just to be our church that's taking over new land. I don't want it just to be our church that's infiltrating this community. I want your life to be like that. Blessed are the meek, for we shall inherit the earth. It's ours if you'll take it. I want to pray for you. Um, I want to pray for you this morning. I don't need to know the details, but if you've been asking God for something, whether it's land or a house or expansion or a new job or a promotion or, you know, something that has to do with inheriting the earth, something where you get more. If you've been praying for something like that and it just hadn't happened yet, I want you to stand up. I'm going to pray this morning that we see some breakthrough in that area. Pay raises, bonuses, new things. Okay, I'm going to pray for you guys, and in return, I want you guys praying for new life. We raised enough money this spring to build an entire church in Nepal. We had prayed about it and said, all right, right, let's. we're going to tithe on the front side. We're going to raise enough to build a church, and then, God, you give us enough money to put this church back here. Uh, and so right now, the dirt's coming in. We don't, we don't have the money to build the building yet, but the dirt's here. Uh, my wife's always talking about preparing for the rain. Faith means you're getting it ready. So we're putting the pad up. And so be praying that miraculously funds just come in that, that can build this building out here. Will you guys pray with me? 
In Jesus' name, Lord, we come to you and we, we hear your word, we believe your word, and we know you to be a truth teller. You've told us that if we'd be wildly obedient, if we would be obedient and strong with discipline and self-control, that you're going to let us inherit things we didn't earn. Father, right now we've got folks standing that have been praying for some things. They've been asking for some doors to open up, for some raises, for some promotions, for some property, for some house. You told us you'd do that. I'm praying this morning in Jesus' name that you do it quickly, that they would see that you're listening, that you would do it quickly, that they would see that you do what you say you will do. Father, I want to worship with blessed people. So bless us in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hey, y'all have a great day, and when your thing happens, come tell me about it. That encourages me. Have a good Labor Day.